Well, good morning. We are here for week two of Clearwater Community Church. Uh, Josh has conveniently uh, titled this particular week Grace and Glory or Glory and Grace. That's the series of our that we've been going through on Sunday mornings. Glory and Grace in Disruption. And so uh, we are here from the offices of Clearwater Community Church and just coming to you briefly this morning with a challenge from God's Word and then giving you some logistical updates. So let me just start this morning by reading from Psalm 122. Psalm 122 verse 1 says this, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And uh, th this verse just uh, was used in a, a uh, in a podcast this week by a pastor to challenge us with an idea, and uh, I think it I think it's important that we start off with this even from the beginning of our, our broadcast this morning. Initially, when Josh and I talked through doing um, something on Sunday mornings while we were stuck in our homes and and could not congregate together as the church, we thought about continuing our series and um, just preaching through John and the Gospel of John and 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 almost treating this as if um, there, you know, business as usual, there isn't uh, a delay that's gonna happen within our church. Uh, but I was challenged uh, on this podcast that used this verse this past week with the reality that what's going on right now is disruption. And because it's disruption, it's, it's something that falls under the very providence of God. And to act like we're just doing church and can continue to do church as normal just isn't right. It's not true. Uh, I think many of you probably feel the sentiment that uh, this psalmist expresses in verse 1 here. Uh, Let us go to the house of the Lord. We want to be with God's people. We want to be in his house gathering as uh, the church this morning. And while we can do that via video stream, this really isn't church, and we shouldn't treat it as if this is church, because we aren't in person together sharing life with one another. And so to, to just continue as if everything is normal, to continue in our sermon series, just doesn't seem appropriate. It, it's not a sermon for us to be standing here or sitting here and trying to preach at you through these video cameras. It doesn't have the same impact that it does when we are gathered as the congregation. So however long this lasts, we're gonna still get together via uh, video streaming here and we will look at a passage of scripture, we'll spend some time with, in God's word, we'll pray, we'll give some logistical updates uh, and, and we'll use this time I think much more as, as devotional uh, and, and, and encouragement as we try to navigate through these difficult times, these disruptive times together in anticipation of that day when we can come back together as the church and, and just celebrate together. I, I don't know about you, but in our own household, there's been a lot of lamenting over the fact that we can't meet as a church. We can't get together with friends uh, and fellowship and spend time together. This, this truly is something that's very disruptive. And yet it's not out of God's purview and out of God's control. And so we wanna use these moments to, to think on, on some of those things. Uh, last week it was Josh and I here together. This week it's just me. Josh is a little bit under the weather and he wanted to make sure that we don't conclude from that that he's contracted coronavirus. We don't believe that's the case. Um, Josh, like many people, struggles with allergies and this time of year is really difficult. I mean, my white car is completely yellow right now uh, from all of the pollen that has fallen upon it. So I, I can imagine uh, that's what's going on in his life. So uh, be in prayer uh, for him that uh, just as he recovers from this and, and be in prayer for one another and we'll spend some more time um, this morning talking about that. Let me just read or start off with a, a prayer that um, comes from a, a book that uh, Josh has used before in reading from uh, certain liturgies from. It's called, I think, uh, uh, Oh, I'm blowing the title of it. Every Moment Holy. I think that's the name of this particular book. It's 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 written as a series of liturgies, and uh, this one is quite appropriate this morning. So think through these words as we open our time with a word of prayer. Uh, but it's it's appropriate for our time right now. That the liturgy itself is titled "The Liturgy for Waiting in Line," and here's what it says: As my life is lived in anticipation of the redemption of all things. So let my slow movement in this line be to my own heart, 
a living parable and a teachable moment. Do not waste even my petty irritations, O Lord. Use them to expose my sin and selfishness and to reshape my vision and my desire into better, holier things. Decrease my unrighteous impatience directed at circumstances and people. Increase instead my righteous longing for the moment of your return when all creation will be liberated from every futility in which it now languishes. Be present in my waiting, O Lord, that I might also be present in it as a Christ bearer to those before and behind me who also wait. As I am a vessel, let me not be like a sodden paper cup full of steaming frustration, carelessly sloshing unpleasantness on those around me. Rather, let me be like a communion chalice reflecting the silvered beauty of your light, brimming with an offered grace. Amen. Let's just open our, our time as well with a, a, a brief prayer. Lord, we thank you for the fact that even in the midst of disruption, you are still able to transform us by your glory and grace. And so we ask in these moments as we gather that you be honored, you be glorified, and Lord, that you challenge our hearts and, and you just speak some words of encouragement through what is said this morning. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we are streaming via Facebook Live this morning, and uh, I did want to just put this out there. There is a comment section here. Uh, if you have any questions or um, things that have come up that you're wondering about the church, um, I'm going to do something that might is a little scary and is a little intimidating, and I don't know where it's going to go, but um, if, if you would like to in there, please post a question. Uh, over these minutes and I will try to answer them towards the end of this particular session this morning. Um, I know there's teenagers and others that are watching this. Um, don't ask me about the color of shoes that I'm wearing or um, you know what's my favorite movie. Uh, I, I definitely don't flood it with those kinds of questions but pertinent questions to where we're at right now I'd love to answer any of those that I can. So. Um, if, if you could put those in the comments, that would be great. If not, that's all right as well, but be careful about that, all right? Um, let's turn our attention this morning in brief devotional time. I want to look at James chapter 4 this morning, James chapter 4, and I'm going to hone in on verses 13 through verse 17, okay? Uh, James chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. Let's just read this passage, and then I'll come back to comment on it in a minute. Now listen, who, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that peers for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. This passage jumped to my mind this past week as um, watching news, paying attention to news, thinking through the timeline of how long we might be in this particular situation uh, due to just completely unforeseen events just a few weeks ago. And it, it's just a, a solemn reminder of the truth of this particular passage. This passage represents really the world's view, the world's system of, of how to approach life, how to approach the accumulation of wealth, how to make things happen for us. So many people in this world today, and even Christians can fall into this trap, that we, um, we add God into our life, we add friends and people into our life, but they are simply there to get our agenda accomplished. And we have an agenda, a, a, a success plan for our future. We have a vision for where we think our life should go, and those other things are added into it to help us get there. And this passage really represents that kind of worldview well, that really life is all about me, my accumulation of things, and me getting the most out of my life a self-confidence, a dependent upon self. And that differs 
from God's view of how life should go. Let me just point out a couple of things that jump out at me at this passage. Number one, the attitude that is expressed by those who are involved in the planning in this particular text. There's a lot of detail in their planning. We will go into a certain city and we will set up shop there and we will buy and sell and and earn profit and do this or that. There's a lot of decisiveness in the planning. They know exactly what they want to do, what they want to get accomplished. Their, Their plans are firm. Their expectations are certain. They know what is going to happen. In the minds of the ones who are planning and scheming here and, and, and have their life planned out, this is a fail-safe endeavor. It, it's really interesting. There's nothing un- unethical in this text. There's nothing that would suggest that what they're doing here is wrong. In fact, we have books in the Bible like Proverbs that uh, indicate a lot of, of good and, and necessity in planning. in in preparing for our future and saving up and and approaching life from a a, a structured plan. But what this text, James 4, I think indicates and shows is a lot of self-confidence in that process and very little dependence upon God. And so we as Christians, even going through a very disruptive time in our lives right now, are drawn back into even our own attitude as we go through this. And what it reveals about what we think about the world, how we approach the world, how we approach success in life. This text really is a strong rebuke for elevating the concerns of of planning and our future and our control over that. Even the desire to accumulate wealth in independence of God. This attitude that is expressed here commits two errors in this text. It presumes, number one, that one can determine his or her own future. Notice verse 14 again. Why why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. Those who plan without God in purview or, or who have God and are just adding God to their plans fail to recognize the brevity and uncertainty of life. James says, why do you think you can control tomorrow when you or control the future when you don't even know what's going to happen to you tomorrow? He uses the illustration of of a mist or a vapor of water. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. The reality is there is no certainty in what tomorrow holds for any of us. And these times in which we are in right now point that out so clearly to us. You know, I was thinking about it. There's a lot of complaining right now going around in the media, going around in, the, um, I think, the comments section of, of a lot of interaction online. Uh, and, and I think even in our own minds about why in the world were we not better prepared for what's happening right now? Why did our government not better prepare us? Why did our country not have enough hospital beds or have enough ventilators or have enough uh, masks and gloves and all of those sorts of things, even for our medical community? But I was listening to a podcast just in the last day uh, of a couple of senators that were gathered, um, national senators, and they were discussing this and they were pointing out a, a a sobering reality, and that is that the United States, our country, and uh, even in the in the situation in which we find ourselves in, was probably the best prepared of any nation in the world to have a situation like this happen to us. We have more hospital beds, uh, ICU hospital beds, than anywhere else. We have more of the medical ventilators necessary to treat uh, intensive or, or people in very critical situations. That's just the reality of the situation. We prepared as probably as best we possibly could for this. And yet, a simple thing like a virus, again, demonstrates that no matter how much you plan and prepare and no no matter how ready you are, you can't control tomorrow. We can't control tomorrow. Our government can't prepare us enough for what lies ahead. And so in the midst of all of the complaining, just remember... God, 2,000 years ago, through James, 
the half-brother of Jesus, has pointed out to us that we can't control tomorrow. We have no idea what's going to happen to us tomorrow. And all of the planning and all of the preparation done by ourselves or by our government won't be enough. Rather than put our trust in our own plans, we should place our trust in the one we know holds the future, knows the future. And that's what leads to the second error here in this text, this attitude of self-confidence, dependence on self, planning, not only presumes that we can determine our own future, but it also operates without even considering God's will for life. Notice verse 15 again. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. In the midst of even the, the, the frustration, the disruption of our lives, as a Christian, this should drive us back to God. But it is amazing how easily we forget God's will in all of this. The reality of the situation, folks, is that God knew this day was coming. And he even included it within his plans for his creation. This particular disruption that is affecting the entire world. Are we cognizant of that reality and are we living our life respecting, submitting to, and trusting God in the midst of this disruption? Why is that so important? Because as his glory and grace is present in the midst of his, this disruption, Here's the other word that we've used a lot in our sermon series. His glory and grace will transform us even through this disruption. That he's using this disruption in some way to transform those who trust in him, those who are cognizant of him, those who depend on him. And so as we go through this, we need to submit our wills, our plans to God's will, even in the midst of being hold up in our homes, even in the midst of having to walk through grocery stores and get frustrated at the fact that they don't have the things that I want right now. Are we recognizing that that is part of God's will for our life at this present moment and he wants to teach us and transform us in the midst of this? This has to inform our prayer life. And our prayer life needs to extend beyond our own individual needs and wants at this time to include all of our brothers and sisters in Christ within this body and to conclude our community and the needs of our community in this. One indicator that this is transforming us and that we are submitting to God's will in the midst of this disruption is that instead of us focusing on our own financial needs, our own financial situation, our own difficulties and the disruptions to our life, that we are cognizant of the disruption that might be happening in our brothers' and sisters' lives, the disruption that's happening in our community's lives, and it should be driving us to our knees to pray for that. And for God to transform us and our attitudes from self and from our own arrogance toward him. Verse 16 points out that this demonstrates, this attitude demonstrates an incredible arrogance in us. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes, and all such boasting is evil. The point of this passage for us as believers today is found in verse 17. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Here's the point. Believers who know the right thing to do in relationship to to the frustration that we're in right now, to the disruption that we are going through. Believers who know to do the right thing in relationship to that, yet don't do it, are living in sin. Verse 17 is probably the most famous verse in James, or one of the most famous verses in James. And many times we pull it out of this context and, and use it, uh, you know, to to challenge our children. You know what the right thing to do is, and because you're not doing it right now, you are sinning. It's easy for us to, to, to use this in the uh, context of a sin of co commission, a sin where I'm committing something, I'm doing something, 
And um, we do that, like I said, we do this with our kids. You're talking back to your parents right now. You know that's not the right thing to do. And so since you're doing it, you are sinning. But the context here is a sin, not of commission, but a sin of omission. And that is leaving God, omitting God from one's plans, from one's current life situation. Instead of submitting and depending on him, forgetting him and getting distracted by all of the disruption and, and worrying in the midst of a context in which God can transform us by his glory and grace. God must be at the center of our planning. God must be at the center of our, our financial planning. God must be at the center of even this disruption in our lives right now. I have to admit, this has been one of my own struggles this past week. Going through part of this is to omit God in the midst of all of the chaos. Uh, I, I am kind of a news junkie and having time on my hands and sitting there listening through radio or podcasts or watching news at night, uh, it, right now it, it's gotten me very frustrated. And I, trust me, I'm very opinionated on what's going on right now. And, and um, I, in my own mind, I have not solutions, but uh, thoughts on what should be taking place and what shouldn't be taking place in response to this. And when the government's not doing things that seem pretty obvious to me, it, it, it causes worry. It causes not anxiety as much, but it causes just frustration at what is going on. And in the midst of that, that can work itself out in the way I communicate with my family or what I tell them about this or even how I treat them. And I caught myself getting wrapped up in this Wednesday and Thursday um, in the news cycles and everything else that was going on. And then thinking about this passage again in relationship to this talk brought me back around to in the midst of the chaos and in the midst of this, this, the disruption, what am I emulating? What am I modeling to my family if I'm getting frustrated and all that's coming out of my mouth and my communication back to them is simply frustration at what is going on in the media or in the government or everything else. I'm demonstrating that I'm not submitting and trusting God in the midst of this. When my thoughts, my attitudes, my actions are only listening to what's going on in this world system and getting frustrated at it, I'm demonstrating exactly what James 4.17 is talking about. I know what the good is, and that is to trust God in the midst of that, and yet I'm not doing it, and when I'm not doing it, I'm committing sin. What sin am I committing? I'm committing the sin of ungodliness. I started a, a book um, with a, uh, an individual over the past few weeks just reading through it, and the book is entitled uh, Respectable Sins. It's Jerry Bridges' book that he wrote oh, a few years ago now, and um, I'm, I'm, I've gone back to it. And it's, it's about sins that are many times sins of omission, sins that we're not overtly committing, but sins that the Bible calls sin many times, and we don't think of them as sin. And the first one in his book that he brings up is the sin of ungodliness. And many times we think of the sin of ungodliness as a sin of commission, like ungodliness would be lust, ungodliness would be anger, ungodliness would be acts of sin. And yet, Jerry Bridges points out in this book that those aren't ungodliness, that's unrighteousness. Those are things that we commit, sins that we do. Ungodliness is, is a sin of, of really heart attitude. Listen to how he defines ungodliness here, and this really struck me. Ungodliness may be defined as living one's everyday life with little or no thought of God, or of God's will, or of God's glory, or of, one, or of one's dependence on God. The New Testament over and over and over again mentions ungodliness as a sin. And as Bridges points out, it's not these acts that we commit, but it's when I am not thinking of God or involving God in my thought processes or in my life, his glory, my dependence upon his will at every moment of my life. And when I'm not doing that, I am sinning, according to James 4.17.
We know what to do to depend on God in the midst of this. And when we aren't, we sin. We model sin within our families and we model sin to our kids, our wives, our friends, our family. So if we're going to truly allow God's grace to transform us, even in the midst of disruption, we cannot be consumed with the attitude of, of the world in the midst of this, of frustration over how we're not being taken care of, or frustration as to what's happening to my finances. No doubt this is disruptive. But this is really a strong test of where our dependence, our trust, our faith truly is. And if it is in Jesus Christ, and it is relying on God to meet our needs, if we're truly godly people, then this shouldn't throw us off, but it should drive us further to our knees. Not so much in prayer, God, just get us out of this situation, but God, walk through us and teach us in this moment what you want to change in us. Show us those attitudes and those those heart idols that we are depending on in the midst of this that aren't you. And God, point out that self-dependence, that self-reliance, and just that, that selfishness in the midst of this that has me so consumed about myself and not about my neighbor. Allow God to transform you even as you go through this time of disruption. As we close this down, I do want to just touch on a, a few logistical things in relationship to what's going on in our, our church body right now. Um, please keep checking in on the website. Please keep going to uh, there to see updates. We'll try to update things as much as we can, probably a couple of times a week. Uh, we do want to point out right away that... Uh, we won't be doing pretty much anything as a church until you hear from us again that starts those programs back up. We're trying as best as we can to uh, submit to the governing authorities over us, our governor, our, our president, and with the, the social distancing that they have put in place, um, we are pretty much shut down up here at church for the time being. And, um, and so we are trying to provide you with some resources to get you through that, but we want to keep you abreast of what's going on as well. Uh, Josh did put on the website again a, a packet that you can go and see that, that is some things that you can do as a family or even as an individual this next week. Uh, we probably will post something on Wednesday, maybe a brief challenge from God's Word again, an encouraging word, um, and and. If, if we do that, it'll probably be out of Colossians 3. That was something that we might have done this morning as well. But with Josh out, he was the one that was focusing in on Colossians 3 this morning. We did not go there. You will notice, though, in the resources that there is a page specifically about Colossians 3. I would challenge you this week, look at Pro or Colossians 3, 12 to 17. Read through there and look at the traits. And the, the resource that's in here actually has you as a family or you as an individual to, to pick a trait for each day of the week that's brought up in that and, and talk about and meditate on how to implement and live out that, that trait in dependence on God, to pray about God or pray to God about that trait and, and, and how you can live that out, model that throughout this week, that you can be transformed by God to be living that out from this week going forward, even in the midst of, of the disruption that's going on, that he could use this right now to bring uh, Colossians 3, 12 to 17 to life in our lives as individuals and as a church. So, so please use these resources. There's some prayer ones in here. There's some other ones, like I said, about Colossians 3 this week, uh, but they would be very good for you to go through as a family. A couple of logistical things I've already pointed out. All programs will be canceled until further notice. Uh, prayer requests, please keep emailing those in to the church's email address or to your elder. I know a number of us have, have reached out to those underneath our care this, this past week and um, are trying to stay in contact with you. If you have anything that comes up prayer request wise, please indicate that. We will try to share that and, and be praying about those things. Um, and, and just as you hear of needs within the body, continue on a daily basis to lift those our, those things up, lift our brothers and sisters up at this time. Uh, there, 
are real catastrophic events happening to individuals' lives even within our church body. We've heard of some who have lost jobs over this past week. Be praying for them. Um, we as, as leaders will be discussing and talking through what kinds of things can we do uh, and maybe even implement to come alongside them and help them through this difficult time. But as, as those things start trickling in, please be lifting them up uh, to God in prayer. Pray, pray for one another with the stress that is happening um, just from um, people sheltering. Uh, and, and we don't even know day by day. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We might get an, an, an order that says we have to shelter in place. Uh, if that takes place, that'll affect even how we do this stuff on Sunday morning. So be in prayer about the, the different changes that are happening in people's lives and the stress that that produces. And be in prayer for marriages. Uh, disruptive times like this, stressful times like this, put a lot of pressure on marriages and marriages that aren't depending on God and aren't walking with Jesus Christ. Uh, those stresses really can... can um, can show where the weaknesses are and can even get people to to drive further apart instead of together in these moments of crisis. So pray for our families and pray for our marriages at this particular time. Uh, a couple of just more day-to-day -day things in relationship to what is happening at church. Uh, the garage sale was planned for the beginning of April and I know we announced that you can start dropping things off. Please do not drop things off for the garage sale. That's going to be postponed and we're not even sure what's going to happen with that right now but uh, in in knowing that we don't want to be taking stuff in or having stuff dropped off so please do not drop materials off right now for the garage sale uh, we will have out in front of the church offices two black bins with yellow lids on them those are for Harriet's drop off uh, Harriet's is staying open as long as it possibly can during this time one thing that is a reality, I mean, if you've been in a store, you know that canned goods and things like pastas and rices and all of those kinds of things that can last a long time on shelves, even Walmarts are running out of those things. Why? Because people are, are just grabbing them as fast as they can. So uh, the, the, the different stores that give to Harriet's right now aren't able to do a lot of that giving of, of those kinds of resources to us. And so we're, we're quickly going through those kinds of resources at Harriet's. And so Harriet's will stay open as long as they have stuff to distribute. But if, if you are thinking of how can I give to that particular ministry, it would be through canned goods. It would be through things like pastas and pasta sauces and, and those types of things as well. So if you have those or are able to obtain those and would like to give some of those to Harriet's, we'll have those boxes out front. When Harriet's times uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, mornings, early afternoon, when there are people there and are open, you can drop it off there. Otherwise, leave it in those bins in front of the church office. Small groups, I know last week we were kind of still encouraging small groups to meet. Um, as of now, we're telling those to sort of suspend uh, uh, as much as possible. If you can come up with creative ways like live chats, that would be great. Um, but even most of our small groups go above that 10-person uh, gathering that, um, that they are encouraging right now. And so we, we are saying for our small groups, and plan not to meet. Although in any way that you can still communicate with one another, um, if you want to get together as individuals around a meal or something like that, I, you know, whatever you're comfortable with, I would say do until the uh, governing authorities might give us more um, stricter or, or stricter um, restrictions. At this time, uh, we're saying don't meet as small groups, but if you can come up with creative ways, please do so. We want you to stay in communication with one another. Uh, lastly, that I have in relationship to logistics, again, is giving. Um, online giving is available. You can go on the, the church website. You'll see a link on there uh, for giving. And uh, you can, in a couple of steps, just set that up and, and, and give that way. Uh, this is the first week I've done it that way. I've done it in the past just still by a check. But this week I set my online giving up and, and, and did my giving that way. It's really pretty simple to do to set up. Um, and uh, I know that it's a, it's a way for you still uh, to support the ministries here at CCC. And um, even as we try to meet the needs of members as, as, as their needs start to increase and arise at this time as well. So I want to just remind you of that. All right. I've, well, I kept that to just about 35 minutes. Let me just take a quick peek at Facebook. 
that's not going to work. Okay. Is that, oh, there's no questions. Okay. So I had some guys looking, no questions came up. If you do have questions, feel free to email into the church again. We'll try to answer them uh, as best we can. Um, but it was, it was good to sit and talk and I hope this was beneficial to you this morning. Um, I want to close our time with a word of prayer and, um, then we'll probably get together either Wednesday or, or Sunday again next week. All right. So let's, let's wrap our time up with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you for the challenge that is James four and that in the midst of chaos, in the midst of disruption, you're still in control. You knew this would happen. And uh, uh, Lord, we as believers are called by you in your word to model well dependence on you, faith in Jesus Christ in the midst of the most disturbing and trying of times. And Lord, throughout church history and throughout this world, there are people who are facing um, much greater persecution than we are presently. But Lord, we do recognize that I think this time is getting a lot of our attention. It is, it is a time, Lord, that, that we are open to and, and, and vulnerable to um, attack. We are vulnerable to our, our most base desires of, of greed and selfishness and lust to really take over and influence how we act toward one another, how we respond to you, how we think of our, our, our country and what is going on here presently. And so God, help us to recognize, realize, and point out to us in the midst of this, this disruption, the ungodliness, Lord, in our lives and how unholy those things are in your presence. And Lord, may we be those who are every day still getting in your word, who are every day spending time in prayer, who are every day trying to make it a priority in our life rather than to just take in media and news and, and all of those sorts of things that can be very disruptive to at, at least take in as much time and give as much time to spending in your word and listening to Christian music and praying for one another. So God, may we make the most of this as individuals and as a church to learn what you want to teach us in the midst of this. This is part of your will for our lives. You are allowing us to go through this right now. And so may we have eyes open and ears attentive to the work of your Holy Spirit in these moments to change and transform us by your glory and grace so that we can better model Jesus Christ in the midst of this turmoil. Lord, I pray that for our individual lives. And at this time as well, I just pray uh, for our, our, our country, our, our leadership. Uh, Lord, we want to submit to them and we, we give a, a level of, of, of trust to them to provide oversight and care for this nation. That's why you have established them, to make sure that justice does prevail. And so we ask that your Holy Spirit is able to accomplish justice and fairness and, and give real wisdom to our, our leaders, our president, our, our senators and congressmen, our our, our, uh, on the state level, our governor, and even in our, our townships and our cities, our mayors and our city councils, that, Lord, as they make decisions that affect our daily lives, uh, may they, they make decisions that are fair, are just, and are right, and are, are filled with wisdom to prepare us better for the future. And so, Lord, we, just, we pray that upon our, our country at this time. We pray this for the world, Lord, that in the midst of all of this, whether it's on mission fields or right here in our own backyards, that those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ would live out and model dependence on you, trust in you, and, and doing the right thing even in the midst of this chaos so that Jesus Christ is communicated and our hope is, is on display, that we have an answer and it's Jesus Christ in the midst of this to share with this world. Lord, may we be those who recognize that and, and live that out and may that be ringing out of the churches and the Christian lives across this world even today as we all 
live in a context that is affected by this particular virus. And Lord, I lift up especially this morning those within our congregation who are struggling right now financially with health in 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 family situations that are proving difficult in in marriages and with children lord that are that are 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 being just fatigued and stressed right now lord that there would be a measure of grace that extends into the, the lives of our families the lives of our our marriages and and lord that we would be driven back to your word and be driven to our knees in prayer and dependence on you in the midst of in the midst of this disruption so lord do your transforming work in our lives and in our church and may all of this be done for your glory we pray this in jesus name amen again it's been good to at least spend some moments with you i hope this time was uh beneficial i hope this time was encouraging and uh, look on the website. We'll try to get something out, hopefully in the middle of the week, and then we'll uh, spend some time with you again next week. Until then, be living out what it means to be a part of Clearwater, uh, Clearwater Community Church, that we are a Christ-centered community reaching our community for the glory of Jesus Christ.